This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, our returning champion for the sixth time, my friend Jonathan Miller. He is founder and CEO of Miller Samuel, where he has been covering the real estate market for the better part of 40 years. Uh, Not only is he an appraiser, he's pretty much been in every single uh, penthouse in Manhattan. Some of the stories he tells, I couldn't get him to coax out stories about David Bowie and other celebrities, but I've heard them all over a beer and they're amazing. There are few people more knowledgeable about what's going on in the state of real estate, why it, it got to where it is today, how it's changing, and what you should know about prices and, and supply in the near future uh, than Jonathan he is just simply the go-to guy when it comes to residential real estate. Uh, I found this conversation to be a lot of fun, and I think you will also. With no further ado, my conversation with Miller Samuels, Jonathan Miller. Jonathan Miller, welcome to Bloomberg. Oh, great to be here. It feels like I've been here before. Uh, you are a returning champion. I think this is your fourth, fifth, something like Sixth. That. Sixth. Right. So every time there is tumult's in the real estate market, my instinct is always to say, let's get Jonathan in here and talk about what's going on in in the real estate uh, world, to talk about what's going on in real estate. Before we get to that, for the people who might not have listened to the previous five (laughs) conversations we've had, why don't we just delve a little bit into your background, starting with you, you said you stumbled into appraising and real estate. Uh, Tell us what that means. Well, uh, actually, I moved to New York in the um, mid '80s, and uh, because my parents had moved here and my sister had moved here, and they're saying this is incredible. I grew up in the D.C. area mm-hmm. and was living in the Midwest, and my wife and I came to a wedding here, and were completely hooked. Within three weeks, we sold our cars and moved and slept on my parents' apartment, one bedroom apartment floor. Uh, within three weeks of uh, our visit here, we just wanted to be here, and there's no regrets. We love it. The the 1980s New York area was kind of transitioning from yes. the really dumpy 70s to, hey, the 80s and the 90s were kind of a boom area. Here. Yeah, yeah. What it, was that transition like? Well, when we moved and uh, we went through, we we basically, you know, got the idea as a family to start a real estate appraisal business. We'd actually raised money um, from Japanese investors <laughs> through an attorney to start a real estate brokerage firm uh-huh. and got to the bottom of the form where you had to sign the dotted line and said, no, let's do appraisal. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> it was, you know, just this sort of odd moment where we really didn't want to become real estate brokers. And, uh, and we had real estate expertise. We had uh, a lot of technology that we were playing with. Um, uh, I used to sell units in an on-site sales condo, um, new development on the Upper East Side. And I literally put the entire Schedule A, which is the pricing square footage unit numbers, in a Hewlett Packard 41B mm-hmm. using bit mapping and we could walk around and I instead of having, you know, when people would ask me, what are the common charges? What are the you know, I, I'd literally have it in my handheld and um and we sort of turned that into a valuation business. And uh it's been since eighty six uh that we've been in appraising property about five billion a year in Manhattan. Wow, that that's amazing. So before we get to the pandemic, which obviously had an enormous outsized effect on real estate. Let's talk a little bit about the financial crisis in the mid-2000s. A lot of real estate companies crashed and burned then. How did you manage through the GFC, and and what sort of uh, world were we existing in back then? Well, actually, I thought, uh, leading up to the great financial crisis, I thought to myself, uh, we're going to be out of business within a couple of years because Nobody wanted an independent valuation. Everybody knew the number but the appraiser. Mm -hmm. And so the system incentivized mortgage brokers to hire the appraisers that made the numbers for them because they wouldn't get paid until the deal closed. Right. And we weren't morally flexible. (laughs) Uh, And uh, so that was really lean 
a lean period. And um, and I remember I was interviewed in some national TV uh, uh, program uh, interviewed me and said, uh, you know, what's the, you know, what do we not know? And I said, most of the appraisals being done through mortgage brokers aren't worth the paper they're written on. And I'd say 75% of them. Wow. And then I was sort of attacked by my industry that at least the local competitors who were very morally flexible and were really doing well and uh in 2008 that same journalist came to me and said this is the guy who told us three years ago that this was going to happen and i i ever since then apparently i got a lot smarter I, you know i right. was saying the same thing but I was right. It just it just sometimes takes a while for people to realize yeah. that the painful thing they're hearing, you know, when there's a lot of pushback, it's because you're telling people things they don't, don't want to hear. hear. And right. they have, they're invested in the old way. And in fact, when I started going negative on the market, um, I remember being in a New York Times front page story about prices dropping X percent. And I remember a real estate uh brokerage CEO uh, to remain nameless called me and said, what are you doing? You know, hey. and uh, you know, this is wrong. You, you know, you can't talk. And I said, tell them the truth. You got to be transparent. And what's really interesting to the industry's credit is there's a lot of market studies out like we publish, but the brokerage community um, has, you know, compared to what it was in the, the eighties and nineties is dramatically more, transparent even though not perfect about what's happening um as opposed to you know in the dark days of lehman collapsing and you know brokers at panels i was on was saying this is just going to last a couple of weeks everything's great right. uh, it's always a great time to buy or, or sell, sell right? right do you remember that ad the yeah. national association i think you wrote a piece about I, like i, a, I might a, have yeah i think I, I where there was like one month out of like the last 20 years that it wasn't a good time to buy <laughs> It was so. it was great. Listen, it's always a good time to generate a commission if you're a commission real estate agent. Which, of course. And my mom was a real estate agent, so this was always right. dinner table conversation. Like you, she wasn't afraid to call people out. Right. Um, the fascinating thing is, we'll talk a little more about the appraisal industry in a bit, but back then, appraisers were not really helping the buyers. They were just helping the brokers – get a bank loan through the process. Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, essentially what no one understood in the industry and still don't understand today in the real estate industry is that the when appraiser is doing an appraisal for the buyer that's getting a mortgage, their client is actually the bank. Right, that's and right. And so, so now there's all kinds of restrictions post Dodd-Frank introduction to the, to the process where you know, uh, people can't talk to you like they could. Back in the day. Yeah. Hey, I have, we're paying this and here's how much my mortgage is. And this is what I need. Right. Keep this it fair. Keep it fair. It's like Rodney <laughs> and Caddyshack. Well, I, Just I, keep I, it fair. I, the term back then was, here's a good appraiser, good in air quotes, yeah. and good translated into making the number. So I was always shocked at the idea of quote unquote comparables. If you're in an upward price spiral that is essentially a mortgage driven bubble what good are comparables hey this house down the street is overpriced 30 percent give these people a mortgage for a house that they pay 30 percent too much doesn't make a lot of sense yeah the the challenge is that you know when we're looking at uh, valuation of a property we're looking more than price price is sort of the caboose at the end of the train mm -hmm. um, leading indicators would be contract activity um, and listing inventory sort of transaction based rather than price based and so i would imagine that would tell a bank hey if this buyer defaults on this mortgage down the road the collateral here's what it looks like the cat collateral won't be adequate in or our not, view, right. or, or could would or wouldn't be a perfect example of that is sort of the when you apply like the greater fool theory to south florida real estate in right. the 80s uh, where uh, it was all about carpenters and nurses flipping, you know, quitting their jobs and flipping uh, real estate and becoming, you know, making a lot of money. And then they would turn around and sell it to somebody else for double and double and double and double. 
And if you actually stood back and looked at a chart of what was happening, prices were going straight up right. and sales were going straight down. And you could <laughs> see it because sales actually lead price direction by right. you know a year in many cases. In fact, in, in 05 and 06, people don't, you know, people were not familiar with the history of the financial crisis. Prices peaked in, I want to say... Summer of 06. 06, and volume peaked in 05. Correct. But the market didn't start to stumble. Market peaked in October 07. Correct. So you still had a full, the, the stock market. So you had a, a full year or two after housing topped before it started to show. And really, the, the heavy stuff didn't start until and the, 08. And the, the answer to that question is always... Consumers, when there's when they they're uncertain, they pause, and so you see the transaction volume drop, but the pricing that's the greater fool theory, right? right. Uh, continue until there's no more buyers, and then the price is correct. So now let's flip that question and talk about the sellers, because we're currently in a little bit of a challenging market for both buyers and sellers. Not enough inventory, mortgage rates are much higher. It seems like sellers are always operating at a six to 12 month lag, maybe even longer. One to two years. One to two years. So so they're always a year or two behind the price, which uh, when things start to slow down and prices start to roll over- They don't adjust quickly. They really don't. And it, I, I'm genuinely shocked that when I look at some prices, I'm like, hey, that was a, the right price in December, 2021. Right. But you're, that, that ship has sailed. Well, it's funny you say that because- uh, in the beginning of this year, when people said, what do you think 2023 is going to be like? I dubbed 2023 the year of disappointment right. <laughs> because people weren't going to get their 2021 price. Uh, the sellers weren't, but the buyers weren't going to see a substantial savings in, um, in, in pricing that prices, prices weren't going to correct. And, you know, and, too little inventory. And, and we, we have this collapse of inventory that is now, Sort of when you think about the the home valuation or just market trends, you know, typically when there's a negative external event like, you know, a spike in interest rates. So if you saw interest rates, you know, the 30 year fix is more than double what it was a little over a year ago, you expect sales to slow down. They mm -hmm. did. And you expect inventory to pile high to the sky, and that didn't happen. And in fact, right now, New inventory is falling. New inventory, meaning inventory is coming in right now, is is actually going negative, and it should year be just, over year comparison. Yeah, it it should be going negative, and it's I mean it should be rising, and it's not. And the the um, and so what that does that you, you're not seeing prices fall because we're actually seeing right now in the second quarter, just looking at the suburbs around New York City, like Westchester, Nassau County, Fairfield County. The market share of cl properties that closed in this recently completed quarter, um, the market share of all closed sales was, depending on the location, typically about 45% of the transactions went to a bidding war, meaning wow. that they closed higher than the last asking price of the transaction. And that doesn't happen when mortgage rates double, right? It makes your brain crack thinking about it because it's so contrary. And that's because the inventory factor is what is throwing all the modeling off. How um, many of those transactions were cash transactions where mortgage rates are irrelevant? Right. So so in Manhattan, we uh, the second quarter had the highest market share of cash transactions no in history, two-thirds of the transactions. Wow. About 65%. Amazing. Now, what's interesting, if you dig a little deeper, is that the it's not that the whole world is just paying cash. It's that the number of transactions for cash buyers and financed buyers both fell sharply year over year. The aggregate total was about 40% year over year. Wow. But And I'm sort of making this simplistic. But cash buyers fell 20% and finance buyers fell 50%. Right. And, and so what it meant was there's a lot less resistance to your point of cash buyers. The other thing it says is that cash buyers skew higher in the sort of price strata. So, you know, one of the stories before the pandemic was Manhattan had almost eight and a half years of unsold uh, supply. Wow. And that's including active inventory for 
for new development, you know, unsold condominiums, whether actively listed for sale or in shadow inventory that the developer could sort of dip into when they ran low of sales. Um, after the pandemic, and because of this sort of this, the pandemic sort of introduced strength to the high end market, um, the, uh, the, um, the share of or the the activity um, uh, uh, continued to favor the high end of the market. Sure. So, so instead of being a market that was sort of the low end was where all the action was, it became a market where the high end was was c- strong because the share of unsold condos fell from eight point three years to about just over three years, meaning it fell by more than half. Wow. Um, to, you know, in terms of what it would take to sell off the supply in, in New York. It was dramatic. So there, there's normally a, a chain of sales. The starter home, Usually uh, about the seven. move up, right? There's a whole run of this. But during the pandemic, a lot of people just said, I'm going to go buy a second home or a third home, a vacation property. So I'm not stuck in a, a city where I can't do anything in a tiny apartment. And that really sucked up a lot of supply. Yeah, the... the um, the way I look at it is in in the city itself in Manhattan and most urban centers, sales activity didn't you know uh, fell by half, uh-huh. and it fell by half because during a global pandemic in a multifamily building, are you going to let? strangers into your apartment? Right. right. The thinking was no, <laughs> and um, but in reality, the buyers that zoomed out to the to the suburbs were largely from the rental market because oh, really? they weren't anchored to another asset. Um, they didn't the, have to sell the affluent. Yeah, they they bought in the Hamptons. You know, a second primary home. I called it co primary at the right. at the time. Um, and and high end markets in you know the the county surrounding New York um, definitely did better and and people moved farther. I mean, my wife and I moved a half an hour farther from the city because we figured we weren't going to be going into the city five days a week. Right. Like I, you know, and you get a lot more bang for your buck the further away you are. Correct. So more property. You, you live on a compound with how many different buildings on that on that property <laughs> in Connecticut? Three. <laughs> That's a lot of buildings. So you, you couldn't get that in Darien, right? right. You couldn't get that right. uh, on the wa- near the water no or way. near a commuter line into the city. Right. At least not for a reasonable price. Right. So we'll come back to a lot of what's going on in New York and the rest of the real estate market. I just want to touch on one more aspect of your background. You're a professor at Columbia Business School teaching a course on commercial real estate. Tell us a little bit about that experience. What's the course like and, and what are the students like at at uh, Columbia Business School. Well, it's uh, it's their architecture school. It's the Masters in Real Estate so Development. So not business school, architecture, architecture school. Architecture school. Oh, it's okay. Masters in uh, Real Estate Development. And so my students are mostly in their, you know, uh, 23 to 29, uh, super smart and very ex- eager to, to get into the business. And um, so what it has allowed me is a venue Every, I, I teach every summer. It's not year round. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually have about 150 students during when we were zooming during the pandemic. I had like 190, which right. there's a lot of icons in your zoom screen, right? Right. You go five or six right. panels in, but the program is fantastic. Uh, and I, uh, I'm one of those people that run up and down the aisles, you know, high five the students. Yeah. Talking. <laughs> and, um, and the other th- sort of secret, passion is I get to tell the same dad jokes every year <laughs> because they haven't heard them before or they have, but not from me. It's a whole new crop it's, of it's a new audience. Victims. Well, right. students, right. right. That's hilarious. And, uh, and, and, and what it's, what, there's nothing better than talking about a topic that you're really comfortable with and really smart people ask you questions that cause you to maybe, you know, think a little bit differently about the solution sure. or whatever. I just I just love the experience. Columbia has been very good to me and you know and and I appreciate it. And the thing that I uh I like most about it is um 
you know, by the end of the class and you're asking, you're asking questions like they'll answer in unison, you know, 150 students, like, like it's like locked into their brain and, uh, there's not, it's totally satisfying. (laughs) That sounds like a lot. I've been doing it for about five years and, uh, my ritual was, and they wooed me for like a they spent like a year and a half, like taking me out to lunch and say, you'd be perfect. And I say, yeah, sure. You have the right Jonathan Miller. <laughs> and, um, and, and then I did it. And, um, and I remember I used to call my father when he was alive, I'd call him in the beginning of the class and say, Hey dad, I just taught my class. And he said, Jonathan, you're so respectable. And I'm like, what do you mean? Wasn't I respectable before? Like, is this like it put the, me over the top? The so. official <laughs> imprimatur of, of society is, it's, oh, a professor in an Ivy League school. Right. You, you have to be respectable. Right. Fun, fun stuff. So what's the state of real estate in the United States? What's going on? Well, what I wanted to uh, it, it sort of comes to mind is um, something that – hasn't really happened in a in a significant way in the real estate industry, but um, there is uh, multiple listing systems across the United States, which are essentially a, a a database for real estate agents and you know for managing listings. Who and, controls that monopoly? <laughs> the real estate brokerage community, National Association of Realtors. Yeah, they, that, they, they own. A, they control about fifty percent of them. Uh-huh. Um, there's also a contingent that are anti. Uh, you know, but but it is it is a product of the brokerage community, and it is an essential tool to them. Yeah. Um, and so uh, this recently, uh, um, one of the big there's three or four major software companies that drive the MLS systems. Uh, Core Logic is one of them with sure. Matrix. Um, there's Flex MLS, and a big one is also Rapatoni. And Rapatoni. Uh, just had a uh, a ransomware attack. Oh, really? And they power MLS systems like in the Midwest, like Cincinnati and San Francisco and um, a few other markets. And they can't, you know, they're stuck. Sort of like what happened in, I think it was Suffolk County, the ransomware attack on public records, where these people make a living out of using mls systems and they they don't have access or there's lots of problems and i just thought about you know you know big data and the real estate community and then you you start seeing the you know as more things go online you're more vulnerable to sure attack and and that's a real problem for so, the housing so i imagine things like uh, zillow and redfin are all powered by mls is that yes their data yeah, like source? they get their data uh you know various ways but yeah that you know like it could create who knows how long this uh this will go go on um and and it's you know it, the mls looks bad because hey you got you know shut down but anybody could get hacked. but anybody could get right. hacked right so uh, there's no real answer yet on what they're going to do and i i just i've never heard of a situation where uh you know you know that's going to really impact the transactional volume in these markets. Huh, amazing. We're talking with Jonathan Miller about the state of U.S. real estate. So, so Jonathan, tell us what's going on in the United States with residential real estate. Right now, the focus has been, uh, you know, the, the inventory challenge and the, the doubling of mortgage rates. Um, yeah, I remember in the beginning of the Fed pivot, a little over a year ago now, where, you know, we started to see rates go up. There was this thinking within the real estate community, uh, or just people that sort of you know tracked real estate, uh, weren't necessarily brokers. That we were going to see, you know, when rates fall again, <laughs> then everything's just going to go back to normal. And it's like, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to be on the horizon. Uh, Goldman Sachs just came out and said, uh, you know, maybe we'll see rate cuts by the second quarter of next year. But they're not rate cuts that bring it from seven to three. They're rate cuts that bring it from seven to maybe six or high fives. Uh, that's assuming Goldman is right. Correct. A- everybody's Correct. been forecasting incorrectly about recessions, about rate cuts. Yeah. So, so let's talk a bit about uh, – I want to talk about rates and I want to talk about supply. Let, let's start with rates. So two years ago, not even a year and a half ago, mortgages, 30-year fixed, you could get as – low as 2.75. Now they're about seven and a half percent. 
Um, how big of an impact has this had on prices, on transaction volume, and on inventory for sale? So uh, the idea that uh, a, a rapid slowdown in sales, that's the first you know, sales generally, depending on the markets, are down 20 to 40% year over year. But Transaction year, volume. Units that sold. But it's important to remember that a year ago was a rocket ship. You know, it was, right. it was an anomaly, historical anomaly. It wasn't... In anticipation of rising rates, a lot of people bought and sold property. In a significantly higher volume that would be considered a normal volume right. in, in every market. And... And so we're coming off of that high. So year-over-year -year comparisons make it look like, you know, you're down 40%, but you were up 50, 80% a year ago over the prior year, right? So what does this look like compared to the pre-pandemic average? Where, where are we? Um, we're, depending on the market, we're generally about, um, compared to, say, second quarter 19, compared to second quarter of this year, um, we're down about, you know, in the 20 to 30% range from normal. Uh -huh. um, what's really interesting and what what is so different is, yes, you have sales drop. So normally you'd expect inventory to rise. If you look across Florida, inventory compared to pre-pandemic, which became my alternative metric to year over year right, right because the distortion that has occurred in in 2021 to and early th uh, well really early 23 has been significant so uh in florida in almost every almost every market inventory is more than 60 percent less than pre-pandemic amazing um and and as a result you can argue well sales are down 25 percent so you say you know, hey, it's mortgage rates have doubled. Well, it's also because you have dramatically less product. And then on an anecdotal level, um, just in sort of ground level chatter in various markets that I, I connect with, um, that the product that's coming in, back to your, like, how long does it take a seller to capitulate to market conditions? Right. The product that's coming in is priced like it's still the boom. And so, you know, and it takes one to two years for a seller typically or a developer to capitulate to the current market, you know, mm -hmm. because what do they do? They just don't sell. They wait. Right. Hey, it's going to get better. There are no signs of capitulation out there, are there? There's, we're starting to see a little bit, um, but not, not in any significant way. I'd say, you know, we were a year in. So I'd say we're going to start seeing it in terms of better pricing um, over this next year, but nothing dramatic would be my guess. So, so let's come back to this inventory question. There, there are two issues there I want to go over. One is um, uh, the, the footprint of people with you know, golden uh, handcuff mortgages. The data point I read recently, 61% of homeowners with a house with a mortgage, have a rate that's at 4% or under. Correct. What Does that mean these people just aren't putting their houses up for sale anytime well, soon? Well, I, I think, first of all, the first thing it tells you is that if mortgage rates drift meaningfully lower, and by meaningful I mean you know in the high fives, right. certainly I'm not talking about fours or 3% range, right. Um, then you're going to see inventory enter the market. Right. Be Which would be good for inflation and good for prices. Good for inflation, uh, good for you know pricing for new homeowners um, because there'll be more competition. Right. And, um, and frankly, at this time, the only thing I see of bringing rates down, you know, um, Besides a recession, which you know we've been forecasting a recession in the next six months for the last couple of years, right. um, is you know the idea that we're going to see you know the Fed at some point, perhaps soon, is going to stop you know pushing rates higher, and when they do, and if they stay still for you know three four months, I think you're going to see mortgage rates drift lower. Mm -hmm but not correct, not drop sharply. Right. And I think that's going to bring more inventory into the market, but still it'll be far inadequate. The The interesting thing about the state of inventory today is, uh, you know, normally new construction accounts for 10 to 15% of total inventory. That's true for Manhattan. It's true mm -hmm. for the nation. Um, and uh, now you have sub-markets where – 
new construction is like 50% of inventory because there's no there's there's and 50% existing cuz the existing has collapsed right it's so, not coming So so let let's talk about new inventory cuz that's um, something i've been uh, railing about for a while post great financial crisis home builders were felt burnt cuz they were building yeah. a lot of houses they were speculating a lot of them got caught leaning the wrong way and they kind of pivoted to away from single family homes towards multifamily and apartments. And if you look at a chart on new home sales going back to the 2000s, it's pretty apparent new home construction collapsed for the better part of the decade that followed the financial crisis, which raises the question, how short are we of new homes relative to where we would have been without all the craziness in the 2000s um, uh, follow, following the financial crisis. What, what is the shortfall of homes that should have been built in the 2010s? Yeah, millions. Millions. And So the National Association of Realtors have a, have a number, the National Association of Home Builders. They're like four or five, the architectural group, I forget the name. They all have thrown out numbers – Two, three, four, five million home shortfall. Correct. That that but seems huge. But it's actually probably worse than that. Because of population growth. Uh, yes. Well, no. It's it's more li- more because uh, if you look at the product that is being built in all the national home builders in the last ten years, they've really there's been a lot of pivoting to higher end homes, yeah, luxury homes. And yep. so when you look at just raw units they're skewed higher end. So I'd say there's a much more severe inventory challenge for starter homes, first time buyers, um, than we really give credit for that, right. I, that, I, that it's the product mix has skewed higher end. Why has that happened? Because primarily land sales, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, land appreciates and improvements depreciate, right? right? The way you should think of it, land is what appreciates. And um, I think we're now seeing a lot of home builders gobble up land um, to sort of anticipate the next wave. I'm shocked when I play around with Zillow. Everybody loves the Zillow surf. And the percentage of homes for sales are essentially lots with new construction on it. And it's not, you know, and they'll, they'll build it to suit. But you're not buying a house. You're buying a, a piece of land and a builder. Right, and that seems to be, especially in parts of Florida, the Hamptons. That that seems to be a wildly disproportionate amount of um, it's of, not of inventory. It's it's not conducive for a first time home buyer environment, you know, to do that mm-hmm. um, because of you know, lending challenges. The other thing I thought was, you know, the numbers that have come out. I I I, I may I don't know if I have this exactly right, but um, that the number of homeowners in the US with a without a mortgage is like 35%. Pretty big. It's, it's So it's everybody who does cash purchase and everybody who's paid off their mortgage. Which would be heavily weighted towards investors. Right. And then long-term homeowners where they've paid down the mortgage. Right. Um but uh you know so you think about transactional volume is being restrained by high mortgage rates but you you do have a large cohort of the housing uh inventory that is or a potential inventory that doesn't have a mortgage issue with it which mm-hmm. i think is um something that's probably not understood so so how many new homes have to be built to sort of stabilize um demand for both starter homes and move up homes versus the inventory that's out well there? it's funny um i uh, uh interface a lot with the affordable housing industry here in new york uh, because our research is, uh, you know, open market. It's not, you know, we're not looking at subsidized housing or anything along right. that line. And uh, the mantra when you talk about like how many more to build, um, the answer across the board is I don't know, but a ton more. <laughs> like M- literally millions of new homes. Yes, like uh, you know that that this is this is the pr- this is the problem. So so let's talk about a specific new home building problem. Um, how difficult are zoning regulations, health department, Department of Environmental Conversa- Conservation, um, just general NIMBY to the ability to put up a decent number of houses? It's, it's significantly challenging. What I find, just maybe as a sidebar to this, is on top of that, 
when you think of things like flood insurance mm-hmm. and the cost of flood insurance, Big. FEMA prices flood insurance basically at a level that the private market can't compete. Right. And so in many ways, the federal government is encouraging development in in flood zones, in flood zones. And right. flood zones are not just on the coastline. You know, we're seeing dramatic. Rivers, yeah. We're seeing dramatic flooding problems in the northeast inland. Uh, Look what just happened in Vermont and New Hampshire. They got, they got slaughtered up there. Yeah. So I, you know, I see ads on TV for FEMA and it's cheap. And I'm like uh, that. That seems counter to sort of public safety. Um, you know, a dozen or almost a dozen years ago when we had Superstorm Sandy hit, you know, one of the byproducts, I know I'm going off on a tangent. But well, a decade ago, that was a, that destroyed huge swaths of yeah, New Jersey and New York and just up and down the whole Yeah, Long stuff. Island, the South Shore. Um, and uh, what came out of that is a lot of product that was destroyed mm-hmm. and was middle class housing. Yeah. And so the resulting product on the waterline, and they rewrote the the FEMA maps for the New York City metro area, uh-huh. making them much much bigger coverage area. And politically, it was shot down because it would make it more expensive. And um, and what we saw in parallel to that is that you know, say you had two modest houses on the shore, uh, south shore of Long Island, that were destroyed. Um, investors would come in and buy both lots and build one big house. Mm-hmm. And that's that's been you know after a significant flooding events like in Fort Myers, um, you know that's what you're seeing come back. It's you know the the existing sort of middle class um, modest housing is destroyed, and those homeowners can't build. What I've noticed on the South Shore of Long Island, both in Nassau County and out in the Hamptons, is when you are rebuilding a destroyed house. Seems the rules are you have to elevate that house yes. ten or thirteen for like substantial, yeah. like a whole flight of yeah. stairs up, and um, everything that's underneath that is just outdoor storage essentially, correct? With breakaway walls, but cement pilings yes. holding the house up on the assumption that there's going to be another uh, storm that will raise water levels five. 10, and that's how they feet. can continue to get flood insurance. So, uh, neighborhood. Uh, where I used to live, uh, ne- the neighborhood next to me in the next town over was on the water. We kept our boat there, and uh, you'd see a house that was, n- you know, normally just sitting where it was sitting before Sandy, right. and then you saw the houses on either side were like on ten foot pilings. Right. Imagine the garage now right. on the second floor. Right. Well, I don't, a lot of these houses. No basements, no garages. Right. But there's a like a carport. Right. The Under, assumption that if your car gets washed away, hey, it's it, it is what it is. Problem. It's not. It, it just. But it was almost comical <laughs> to see all these garages on the second floor, and you can't really get your car up there. Uh, so it's obviously going to be redesigned and made into some. Oh, other so sort. these are existing houses. Yeah, that like were lifted. A, like think of a raised ranch with a two car garage on the side. Right. Now the whole thing gets raised up to the second floor. Uh, so it's really a three-story structure, right? right? Pilings and place to park your car. The first floor, which is now the second floor, which is where the garage was. And uh, so you got to think, um, the data is not definitive yet, but the house that's in between these two properties is going to be punished uh, in value sure. because the buyer, you know, if they want to have flood coverage, they have to elevate or raise the house. Huh. That That's amazing. There's a house near by where my in-laws live out in the Hamptons, and I'm like, I- I'd like to take a look at that house. So Saturday morning, I call the agent, and uh, or I-, I do an online request, I'd like to see the house, and the text comes back, the seller requires 24 hours notice, and I just remember my mom saying, hey, a, a buyer wants to come look at your house. I don't care if you're having a wedding. Send everybody I don't care next if it's door. Three in the morning. Three right. in the morning. <laughs> open the house. Show because you don't know if that's the right buyer for your house. Correct. And I was like, well, uh, you know, uh, we could try tomorrow, but you know, uh, l- let us know. They get back to us on Wednesday. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, we already have an offer in on another house, but thanks. Yeah. For the call. And um. Yeah, because because really, especially. Uh, even more so today than a year or two ago, you have to be 
uh, bend over backwards in, a, in accommodation as a, as a seller to be accommodating. Uh, you don't control. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. You do because there's a shortage of listings. You still have control of the transaction in that sense, but it's you don't have the same level of control you had a year, year and a half ago. But not only that, as your mother was very, very accurate in her assessment, uh, you shouldn't think that way, right. you, you know, unless you're It not- evinces the wrong attitude for a se- Listen, I- I've owned a bunch of property in and about New York over the years. I've had some terrible sellers we've purchased from, walked away from deals. There are other sellers that- but for my wife, the deal never would have gone through. Right. And um, there have been other sellers who've been and buyers who've been a pleasure to deal with. Like, I wish I had another house to sell you. You've been a delight. Right. Um, <laughs> and so when the first, the like, it just rubbed me the wrong way. They require 24 hours notice. Yeah, that's. To show a house on a weekend. Right. Hey, tell you what, let's have this conversation again in, in six months and Maybe I'm wrong and you'll get more than the three million ask, which is crazy for this house. Or maybe you'll realize you made a mistake. But the process is just like, oh, from right out of the gate, you're going right. to be difficult. I, I I don't have time for sellers like that. Well, it's funny, you know, in this in this market, like we sold right as the market pivoted. I remember, uh, and um, and my wife always kids me about being overly eager to pay full retail yeah and so we went into a uh the house that we ended up buying we ended up um uh paying that we beat 30 people you paid way over ask only 36 (laughs) percent Right. Although I now, thought, did they price it low to cause yes, a, a bidding I, I think, frenzy? I, I, you and know, you you gave it a straight up appraisal. Yeah, I thought it was about fifteen percent underpriced, and you um, overpaid by fifteen percent. Right, right, uh, and but I don't really care. <laughs> Right. Uh, I, this is the house you're going to live in for the rest of your life. You're done. It's going to be a long estate. time, yeah. and and also too, we just absolutely love it. And I've never looked at it as an investment vehicle. Uh, housing itself, it's just a slow moving asset. And right. Um. I in fact, the last three houses, I haven't paid under the ask. We haven't That's paid really under interesting. the ask. Yeah, yeah, because of the timing that it came on, and it was like you know, t- I always seem to we're ready to move like we became empty nesters that's why we moved this last time our four kids are all gainfully employed and you know out of the house and out of the house and and uh and we wanted to live a little bit more in the country and so it was just perfect but it was like i for shock value I always you know i always own it you know and say hey you know we overpaid and, and over the court here's the crazy thing especially if you're rolling out of a similarly priced house yeah in the and i've had this argument with my kid brother who you know he just looks at the trans he looks at it very transactionally yeah. and every, dollars and cents and i'm like think about it if you're in that house for 20 years and you overpaid 20 percent in the grand scheme of things does it matter it's really not sig- people have a very hard time yeah. wrapping their head around that nobody wants to overpay for anything right but this isn't a car or or a piece of furniture Toaster, that, right? right? Appliance, this right. is a, where you're going to live, where yeah. your homestead is going to be, right. where your hearth is right. for you know the next couple of decades, a couple of bucks one way or another. And I know that sounds flippant, but, but it isn't. No, I mean that's how we thought about it. Uh, it was perfect, and uh, and we were jo- joking because our old house was built in 1825, and this one's built in 1755. Right, so you're we, running out of we, centuries we, to buy houses. Right, we in. wanted to. Next one is 1600s. I, I really, we really wanted to get something that was built before the U.S. was a country. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the rethink that the pandemic caused, how it changed our relationship with real estate work prices where, where do you even begin it's just such a giant topic is it safe to say the pandemic caused us to rethink everything about real estate i think that's a fair description in fact i think the easiest way to sort of start talking about the subject subject is the idea that uh zoom became ubiquitous within 24 hours after the lockdown right suddenly Everybody in the world (laughs) knew what Zooming was, and you had probably never heard of the software beforehand. While there had certainly been, there's other video products, this was far 
easier to navigate. And it became part of our culture almost overnight. Um, and so as a result, uh, it changed what I call, I described as the tether between work and home that normally when people, majority of people that are buying homes that aren't retired are, are thinking about the commute and how far away and uh, and that all got thrown out and we're rethinking it to the point where um, you know we've seen people move farther from the city I'm one of those people where I don't go into the city as much as I did um, there are people that uh, that you know love still working five days a week and there's people that don't want to work at all in the city you know in the in the office it's not it's not the work and it's not even the office it seems to be the commute it's the commute. is the biggest problem and i think the pandemic kind of made us realize a lot of us have a too long commute and an uncomfortable commute and when you're shopping for a house you kind of imagine well i'm 47 minutes away from the door to then you actually do it day to day, and there are delays, and there are misconnections, there Always. are this. And what was supposed to be a 47-minute commute is really an hour and 10 minutes, and that adds up 10 times That's a week. time out of your life that you can't get back. Right. that's gone. Uh, the, the other thing, I think right away, uh, the, the sort of stereotypical description of work from home was suburb to city. You know, right. people moved out of the city. They bought, you know, they they lived with relatives, or they, you know, bought houses or rented, and then commuted via Zoom into their their job in the city. The problem with that, first of all, is completely misleading. Uh, there's, I contend, there's just as many people on the upper uh, east side of Manhattan that were. Uh, work, doing work from home as people that live in Westchester. I right. mean, you know that 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 um, the city people are committing commuting in the city the same way. So it wasn't about like the you know driving in or taking the train into the city so much as it was just physically not going to work and working in your pajamas um, or you know just you know totally a lot more flexibility, a lot a lot easier. You feel. And, and at least in the beginning of the pandemic, it felt like, and maybe I'm projecting my own experience, it felt like I was working more hours than I normally would because I gave up, I gave up the commute, I gave up bathing, I gave up right. getting dressed. Like, right, right. you roll out of bed, you sit at your desk, and my wife would say, hey, you've been there for 14 hours Time the for time. dinner. Yeah. And it's like we used to joke, we shower Saturday night whether we need one or not. <laughs> and at, at a certain point, she would come into the office, the the yeah. office upstairs, and say, listen, you got to open some windows and add this room out because <laughs> it, it's getting rank in here. I, I just picture that replayed all across the country. Absolutely. So, so uh, listen, I love going into, I love being in the office. I, I like work. Yeah. But everything that takes you to – listen, I know people who commute from the Upper East Side down to Wall Street, and it takes them about as long to get to work as it does me coming in from the burps. Yeah. Right? And it's just we, – we don't have the sort of mass transit they have in Europe. Yeah, and I think uh, you know there's, there's people that have the opinion that we're going to – uh, revert back to let's call it four and a half days a week, you know, right. where like, you know, weekend schedules, people work half days on Friday, but just, you know, call it four and a half days a week. And I contend that, uh, you know, we're probably, you know, if I had to make up a number, I'd say we're at two and a half to three days a week right. as that's an average. Right. Yep. Um, that's what we are in our company. And most of the people I interact with, you know, it's, it's, it's like a little less than three days. And, the argument is, um, first of all, that can vary by, you know, you have in industries that are more collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, the challenge is you can't, it's harder to build corporate culture and to train new talent. How do you mentor young kids who right. have Right, so that's the challenge. You can't do that over Zoom. You can't. And so that is what's going to be figured out over the next five to 10 years. I don't think that's there's a quick solution. Um, and you definitely have, you know, some industries or some companies that, you know, want five days a week right now. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, what I've heard is like, hey, you're in a, you know, we're going into a recession or a weak economic period. So therefore, everybody's going to go into work four and a half days a week because they want FaceTime with their boss. And, um, you know, I just don't think that's 
it's not re- realistic. It's not realistic in my mind. I don't care whether the economy is strong or weak. It's not going to be the same. But, um, you know, again, I, I think probably we're at a, a period of time right now where it's, you know, the default is going to be more time in the office than we have right now, um, but not much more. So so let's talk about some other impacts of the pandemic. You, you were one of the first people who wrote about, hey, the death of New York City has been oh. greatly exaggerated. And, you know, every time there's a sale, I, I actually just shared a silly article with you from the New York Post earlier. Okay. All right. So there's a little, there's a town adjacent to where I live called Center Island. Yes. A small town, a, a couple of, a right, couple of, you know, there's a few hundred houses on it. And the New York Post, and Billy Joe lives there and he just listed his house for right. sale for $49 million. And it says, um, uh, just mass sales of houses on right. Center Island. Who who are they selling this to? Right. Is, isn't there Buyers. also isn't this a mass <laughs> purchase of homes? Right. Like a, every time I see see that sort of argument, and we have a similar argument in the stock market. All this cash on the sidelines. What do you mean? I sold the stock for a hundred dollars. Somebody had to buy the stock for a hundred dollars. This exact same amount of cash as right. there was beforehand. Right. It's, so how could there be massive selling if there isn't a match of massive buying? Well, uh, that. New York Post is the one that had that article that was just a brilliant move, you know, for getting, you know, attention because it was so, you know, you have a nightclub owner saying, not only saying New York is dead, right. they added New York is dead forever. Right. Like, uh, you know, proclamation. You could say his name, James uh, Altucher. Yeah. Uh, which ultimately led to Jerry Seinfeld's counter argument and between Altucher and Seinfeld I'm in Seinfeld's camp absolutely but, but but now let's talk specifics and let's put some meat on the bone uh you discussed how how there's been a huge influx of purchasers and renters yes uh, of, of young people coming from other parts of the country other cities uh, what's going on in the U- in the New York City real estate market? Well, what's really interesting, if you look at the census data, because, you know, I think, you know, the term migration um, right. can take, you know, all kinds of uh, connotations. In the, in the context of New York City, the concept of net migration, you know, right. what's, the, what's the difference between inbound and outbound? And in 2022, according to census, uh, Manhattan had a net inbound Manhattan, not necessarily Manhattan. Brooklyn, the Bronx. The or other Queens. boroughs had a sharply a sharp drop in the outbounds, meaning that everything got a lot better. Uh-huh. The narrative is, and I remember in the early days of the lockdown, um, where if I read and took every headline to heart, right? You know, because the key words, like you had told me years ago, like if you put gold in your post title, right. you're going to get a lot of traffic, right. right? And the words during the pandemic were exodus right, and the phrase fleeing the city. Fleeing, right. And and, and so I took it as, uh, you know, this was in the spring of 2020. I was thinking, boy, if all this is true, there's going to be 11 people left in Manhattan right. in the by the fall, which of course was not the story. Um, and we've seen a you know, and it creates this really confusing narrative because we have office buildings right. that are fifty percent or less than fifty percent used, according to Castle Card Swipe data, right. um, as sort of a proxy for that. And then we have record rental prices, right, right where people if are. If only there was a solution to be worked out. Then. Right, right. So, so you know, the solutions we've talked about a lot is this idea of converting unused office space to rentals which post 9 11 down in the wall street area of new york it took a couple of years but there was a massive conversion yes. from office to to now those were older buildings right they class little, b or c right now you have uh, just so you have midtown south you have hudson yards you have the high line you have midtown proper there's a ton of new office buildings that yeah. have been put up in the past decade. But the numbers don't work. Like to convert them to residential, um, uh, any developer will pretty much say that's not possible. But on the margin- there Talk to are... me after the bankruptcy sale. See if it makes well, more sense. Okay, then. so that's the next stage. So so when you think about it, and you know, my company was looking for new 
office space. We ended up staying in the same space, got a great deal, build out and all that. But what we found when we were looking at, we are looking at class B, you know, there's right. A, B, and C for those who aren't familiar. And uh, really, the upper half of class A isn't going to be impacted in right. a significant way. It's the bottom half of A and B and C, it's all bets are off, right? right. And um, the one thing that I didn't fully appreciate until I went through sort of looking for space is that many, you know, we were talking about sellers capitulating to the weakened market conditions. Right. In the office environment, landlords, many landlords can't capitulate because the debt service, um, they can't cover the debt service. Right. So I think the way this is going to play out, and it's already starting, you can read about, you read in San Francisco, you can read in New York City what's happening, is that uh, we're going to see um, a lot of, a tremendous amount of office space move from weak hands to strong hands. And to keep in mind, the, the people are concerned about this being a systemic threat. I keep seeing these no, clickbait headlines. Every one of these buildings is its own LLC, its own corporation. Right. So if if you're a giant real estate trust and you own a thousand buildings and one building is in trouble, well, if that building goes belly up, it's like, oops, sorry, and, right. and on to the next. So now you're down to 999 buildings and you don't have the troublesome building. This can take place in a very managed process where one building after another moves from weak hands to strong I, hands. I, I, and and that's where you could see you know more creative, re, you know adaptive reuse where the, the uh, you know the new owner um, is able because they don't have the same level of debt service. Um, so prices can come down or come down to market, happen. and you know you can you know uh, you know think of other reuses of the property. Um, what I uh, uh, you know what also a lot of people don't realize don't think of it when they think of this challenge is especially in midtown manhattan where you have these very big office buildings the floor plates too too far from the windows to be uh right unless they replace all those elevators with like a interior courtyard right right or uh you know they 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 create a you know a court you know like sort of like a an alley or you know a center they dig you know, they cut out the cut through the floors but that's very expensive right yeah. so so there, there's ways around it, but it, it is not like one of these, hey, let's flip the switch. Right. It, because of the debt service, it's gonna t this is going to take f four years. or five years yeah. at a minimum to sort of see it. But uh, it'll eventually, one assumes market forces will eventually rebalance the demand for office space, which correct. is falling, and the demand for a residential, which seems to be Strong. maintaining. Yeah, actually the joke uh, during the pandemic is Manhattan's just becoming all residential, right? Everything's gonna convert to uh, residential. That was sort of the thinking. Um, Th think about how crazy it is how much new office space hit the New York market right before the pandemic. Hudson Yard yeah. Yards is millions and millions of square feet. And by the way, if you haven't been there, it's it's, it's spectacular. spectacular. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's like the new version of Rockefeller Center. And every time I see a new building going up somewhere, you're like, wow, that's huge. Right. Uh, I walk by the J.P. Morgan Chase building all the time. Yep. And they seem to not care about the excess office space, they're putting up a giant building on Park Avenue. Right, right. I think part of that, though, too, is that there's like a four-year, right. five-year right. lead that time. That started right? in 2018. Exactly, right. So, so, but that that's part of it. But yeah, like the long-term view. Um, but I look at it as uh, when, so the, the, the big problem or big challenge is New York City's budget is over 50% of revenues are real estate related. Really? That's and so, giant. so I don't know what the division is or the breakout is for commercial um, specifically, but it is, it is inherent in our revenue structure um, uh, for real estate to succeed. And even before the pandemic, we had changes in laws like the mansion tax. Right. Uh, the the rent law changed so that conversions of existing buildings are almost impossible. Um, so you know the those sort of large scale revenues from residential real estate are severely challenged going forward to the city, and it's in the city's interest. The city's sort of 
caught, you know, the, the state is the one that's driving these new laws. Right. Um, but the revenue is critical to the city for the city not to rely on the state. Right. Um, so it's sort of this catch-22. Right. Back back when we had de Blasio and Cuomo, they both despised each other. Yes. And there was no cooperation. One would hope that the, the new mayors and the new governor get along a little better and would allow us to uh, make some rule changes. So so let, let's talk about, you mentioned migration. There has been a general shift lasting decades towards the Sun Belt. Yes. Um, I think it was uh, Steve Johnson wrote about how air conditioning made this possible, like people don't want to live in Louisiana without AC, or at least a lot of people don't. But this has been going on for quite a while um, what's it look like now? I, I recall, so we looked in Florida in 2019 yeah. on the West Coast, and I didn't know, did I want a house? Did I want a condo? You don't have to worry about maintenance on the condo, but then you have neighbors and a house, you have a little more. And between then and two years later, like these little houses. Prices are little, up 40%. Uh, more than that, double. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's no bargain in terms of real estate taxes. Florida real estate taxes are like New York real estate taxes. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, the way to think of Florida, the way I think of it, uh, it, without sounding like I work for the Tourism Board of Florida, right. is um, the real estate industry down there, because of work from home, is undergoing restructuring. Right. That it's sort of evolving from a place you go to vacation or visit to a place that you live. And what is remarkable about some of the towns uh, uh, or cities in Florida is they now hire employees specifically to recruit uh, CEOs from the Northeast right? who then will bring their companies and to the Florida. Base. And yeah. they've had, I'd say, you know, there's been some standout results. I wouldn't say it's you know, over the top successful, but it's certainly um, their population growth since the pandemic. Florida is up about seven percent. I mean, the, substantial, substantial, and and so uh, you know, New York State and the New York metro area has to think of themselves in competition with other areas, uh, absolutely. Uh, which is it is seemingly unable to do. I had a buddy who runs a bond shop and about 15 years ago, he relocated to Sarasota, Florida. And he said, John Corzine, then governor yeah. of uh, Florida, of New, New, New Jersey. Jersey. He said, John Corzine bought me a house in, in Florida, meaning his taxes had gone up so much. Moving there was, was uh, yeah. a, a yeah, painless like transaction. <laughs> um, although that said, that 7% boost isn't evenly distributed. And there's lots of stories about these areas in Florida, particularly on the East Coast, but parts of the Southern West Coast that have just been overrun. The infrastructure can't handle it. There's a t you, you bring all the Northeast right. problems. So there's a lot of traffic. The schools lack capacity. Even the, the water and, and electrical grid yeah. and sewage grid can't handle it. Right, flooding. Uh, are, are these areas ready for this influx of, of migrants? Uh, it's a tough balancing act. Um, you know, you can certainly see in housing prices that uh, there's, even with all the building that's going on, there's inadequate supply. Mm -hmm. um, the focus seems to be on other institutions that create employment like healthcare, uh, you know, medical, you know, tech, medical type services. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on sort of competing with New York, bringing financial services there. Right. You know, there's been a lot of marquee announcements like Citadel and others that have Arc, you know, yeah, another that, one. that they're going to move their, their so, location. So there's out. been chatter about uh, that you had this big surge down to Florida, and now some of that's begun to reverse and people have come back. There was a hilarious article in Bloomberg where they were quoting a trader who had relocated temporarily to Florida and the line that stood out was the the only problem with living in Florida is all the Floridians right and, right, right and I thought that was hilarious um and some of these folks have been coming back to New York how exaggerated is the migration to away from California into Texas away from New York and Massachusetts into Florida? I, I mean, it looks like it's real, but are are the numbers hyped up? 
Uh, no, I don't. I I think it is real. It's probably exaggerate. Well, it is exaggerated a bit, but it it's clearly something that changed um, uh, during the pandemic. And the reason why I say that is um, in two thousand January first of two thousand eighteen, the federal salt tax was initiated. Uh-huh. It's you know I used to think salt stood for state. And this would be like one state of my and local tax. My Columbia student jokes. You know I used to think salt tax stood for or salt stood for state and stood for strategic arms limitation treaty. <laughs> um, um, but uh, you know state and local tax where um, the the deduction on the combination of your state and local taxes and your your property taxes. The deduction was only t- it was capped at ten thousand right. dollars. When you have houses in Westchester with annual real estate taxes of one hundred seventy five thousand right. dollars, you know that's a tremendous cost hit. Um, uh, so I don't know what my point was. But, but, uh, well, well, the the takeaway about what does that do to the so called high tax blue states? Yeah, and is this well, is this well, a, so, so a the, jujitsu that benefits the low tax red states? Right. So so. Th- the thinking was um, when that law went into effect uh, January 1st of 2018 that, you know, it was going to be like the Beverly Hillbillies packing up and like right. going to Florida. And uh, and the brokerage community was all telling me, you know, we're sitting there, we're waiting. Didn't happen. And it it didn't happen in at scale. It, it, it was definitely noticeable, but it wasn't this mad gold rush. Right. When the pandemic hit, that was, that was what really stimulated the migration, um, whether it was temporary or full-time. So so where are prices stabilizing? I look around, I see Florida isn't the bargain it once was. Cheaper right. than New York, but not as cheap as it once was. Right. And when you look at, uh, so Florida loves homeowners association fees between the, the state real estate tax and HOAs. Yeah. Florida doesn't seem like like much of a bargain. Where, where are prices stabilizing, and where is some value left? So I would. What's a little different, and why I call Florida going undergoing this restructure rather than it being some sort of fluke or you know high moment in price and then it's going to go down, is um, because of work from home, as I said, and um, part of what's happening is uh, the market is maturing. Um, it's pivoted into, there's a lot more high end. So one of the things that I noticed, you know, like as a hobby, I collect, uh, cause I'm a dull and boring numbers guy. I collect 50 million plus closings across the U S right. and, and you used to, you used to put out a chart tracking yeah, the number yeah, of 50 yeah, million dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I, you know, I put it into my newsletter periodically and, uh, you know, it used to be something, you know, over $50 million was like LA and Manhattan and the Hamptons and maybe an occasional sale in Palm Beach. Right. Now it's, you know, dozens of markets in in Florida in, in general are seeing these transactions. It's much more uh I'm just thinking of that as a proxy for sort of sort of this discovery of Florida is much more broad based than than hey, Miami and Palm Beach. That right. that's it. It's a lot more spread out than it was and I think that says a lot about how the economy is expanding into this sort of year-round uh, living. Um, although, if you've ever been in Florida in July, you, you would question. You would question that. I you, do have a one of my my oldest son got a great job offer, and he works in Fort Lauderdale, coming from Connecticut, and he likes the heat. <laughs> so, right. So, uh, Talk to, well, it's August. Uh, what What is he saying now? He, D- he, did you realize that photons have so much mass <laughs> when they hit you? It it, it beats you. you that can sun feel it right. Yeah, yeah. It, it has weight. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it. You know, he's still an enthusiast. So, All right. uh, so I, I guess uh, if you, you know, I used to jokingly say, Florida in the summer, you run from air conditioned yes. house to air conditioned car, like New York in the winter, you run from heated house to heated car. It's just the opposite, and and the only Texas diff- too, same idea. Right. It's just, but it hasn't been getting much colder here, but. You know, parts of the Southwest, a lot hotter. Texas, and now parts of Florida. You see what's going on in the ocean off of. So right. that I, I wasn't planning on asking you a climate change question, but it certainly raises a question: At what point do does these like wildfires and persistent heat and water shortages? And I'm not asking this as a 
um, left or right argument. At what point does this affect property values? It does become harder to get insurance. Like, what are the economic costs of what's going on with all of these climate-related disasters we keep seeing? Yeah, uh, and actually, you know, we're seeing a high, you know, climate change. I think of it as just bringing a higher frequency of disasters and larger scale disasters. So into bigger the mix. and more. Other than that, no. other than that, nothing. Other to than worry that, about. it's a hoax. Uh, it's a, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, what's interesting, you know, and and uh, so first of all, you know, a it it adds to your cost of home ownership. B you have the insurance industry sort of grappling with can they continue at the premium, even close to the premiums that they're with, when you think of, there's already insurance crisis in Florida. I mean, th- it's crazy what's going on there. You can't, it's very hard to get insurance. And and that was my point uh, before is that, you know, uh, FEMA, a federal program, is basically cutting out by having such low pricing relative to the private markets, is cutting out the private markets. So it's just bringing on more risk onto the taxpayer right. um, for these locations. Uh, yeah, wildfires in California. Um, all this just means uh, a higher cost of home ownership and eventually some markets not being suitable for occupancy. I mean, you know, I mean, that's that's really what it comes what, what down has to. What Phoenix been triple digits for like 21 days in a row? Yeah. I mean, that's hot. Yeah, we have But at least it's a dry oven, <laughs> right? It's a dry 112 degree. Exactly. I mean, they've had crazy crazy yeah. numbers. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I uh just as a kid and, you know, as an adult with kids, I always went north for vacation, uh-huh. like skiing or cold weather. And um, the idea of that heat, uh, my relatives that have moved to Florida, all you adjust to it. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just not willing to. <laughs> so it, it it it's certainly uh, an unusual thing. So so if Florida isn't a bargain anymore, what parts of the country still are? I I know people look in the Carolinas and Virginia. Um, there are parts of the the West, uh, Montana and Utah and Colorado that I, seem to I, be interesting. Know, I. You know, it's funny. Um, we have good friends in Montana, and uh, I look at the housing prices of things they're appraising. Right. And it's. I don't mean the five thousand acre ranches. No, no, I no. Mean, I mean single family houses. Have they gone up also? Uh, absolutely. The that's way that's all it, California exodus. Yes, that's part of it. With more Idaho, but uh-huh. but yeah, absolutely. The way the way I think that we should look at uh, housing prices in the U.S. Um, during this pandemic is virtually every housing market was impacted. Right. And we saw dramatic price growth in a very short pe- period of time because you know the Fed, I believe, kept rates too low for too long and now have to undo the damage um, by making rates a lot higher. But prices aren't really falling no because the, right. the rapid change in rates has basically kept inventory frozen. Huh. Re- really fascinating. So, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in uh, the world of, uh, of appraisal. You, you've been an appraiser for decades. The space seems to be going through a little bit of turmoil these days. What, what's going on in Appraiserville? <laughs> Appraiserville is what it is. Um, yeah, uh, so you know, in the residential appraisal world where you, know, you buy a house or refinance your house, uh, your mortgage on your house, you know, appraiser comes out values the property and then um, and then gives the appraisal to the bank and then the bank decides what how much money they're going to give you and then you close um, this industry uh, is um, uh, if you think about the numbers of people there's about 75,000 appraisers nationwide um, there's organizations and trade groups um, that are active, but really the whole industry has been asleep at the switch for the changes that have been coming. Um, I have been publicly highly critical of an organization called the Appraisal Foundation. And, and, and let me just annotate that. 
you have been humiliating those guys <laughs> on a regular basis, just embarrassing them for not doing their jobs. A- am I overstating that? You've called them on the carpet repeatedly. Yeah, it, it began during the pandemic, and uh, and it's just an endless array of problems, which I'll, I'll sort of explain in a second. But what it led to is... Um, uh, this idea, and it's one of the platforms at, of the um, uh, Biden's um, White House in terms of um, removing racial bias from the appraisal industry, residential and commercial. Right. And for context, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks 400 industries in the U.S. Uh-huh. And on the matter of diversity uh, in 2021 – the appraisal industry was 400th out of 400 in diversity. Wow. We were less diverse than farmers and ranchers. Wow. And um, and this, it, you know, it fluctuates a couple percentage points up and down every year. Um, but the structure of the industry and how new people to get in um, is was created by the Appraisal Foundation, and, and they have basically refused – to take any action they set up committees and councils as if that is action but they don't actually do anything right and um and so uh it be, it's become more and more heated to the point where the appraisal subcommittee which is allowed to monitor and review the appraisal foundation the appraisal foundation is basically f- to maintain the sort of the the verbiage of our license you know our right. certification what we're supposed to do and um and you know like the the appraisal subcommittee which is is the basically provides no oversight this this appraisal foundation not-for-profit literally has no oversight they figured out a workaround which i've exposed uh-huh. And uh, and they're flying to Dubai first class and they're going to, you know, having meetings in Palm Springs and, you know, which, living the high life, which all could be on Zoom. Right. And um, and it's a very sort of it's a monarchy. To, to be fair, Dubai is where all the best appraisers go for, you know, continuing all their education. Training. Yeah, right, they, right. especially from like Iowa and, you know, right. Montana. So so let's let's put some flesh on these bones yeah. so people understand what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, and there have been not one but multiple stories about a black family in America owns a house. Right. They want to refinance. They want to take advantage of low rates. They have an appraiser come in. The appraisal comes in not only too low for them to do the refinance, but too low compared to the neighbor's house. So they request another appraiser, only this time all the photos of the black family, any indicia of African-American homeownership goes away. They literally hang photos of the smiling white family. They have their neighbor greet the appraiser, the white woman from next door. So she greets them, and lo and behold, the appraisal comes in pretty much as expected. Right. That that sounds like a, either a ridiculous sitcom or a made up story, but but this is a real thing, isn't it? It's it's largely it's yes, that's that's largely the way we've seen um uh, a dozen or so of these stories and they get recirculated and, and over, over and, and over. over again. Um what we're actually seeing now is so the logic is that hey, you know, I think my home is worth five hundred thousand. You appraised it for four hundred thousand, so you're a racist. Well, that's a little that's a little over the top in the other direction. Correct. So, so, but that is that is a big part of the narrative. So, so you have like two core uh, uh, parts of the appraisal world. You have now you have a whole sloth of people saying, "Hey, I'm not a racist. Like, I'm just assessing the value." And then you have people like me that are saying, <laughs> "Let's not." That, you know, we don't have a leg to stand on as an industry. Say, hey, you're 100 percent white. And lo and behold, you're appraising black owned homes in, in white neighborhoods for less than the white. owned Correct. Homes. So, so it, it's raising so, some questions. So you're sort of preaching to the choir when you say, hey, we're you know, we don't have this problem, even though. Uh, and listen, is there, you know, uh, unconscious bias in everyday life? Of course sure. there is. Right. So the other side is my focus is to 
force the foundation or remove the leadership of the foundation so that so that the regulatory world um, or you know sort of the government uh, side of the the story you know that there's a representative membership you know not zero of right. people of color right <laughs> that's the first step because this other step is just not effective right so I've been talking about this for for like a couple of years and then the appraisal subcommittee which is made up of like the head the heads of you know of uh of various organizations like FDIC and the GSEs and you know the, Day, alpha, Mac. Yeah, the 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 alphabet soup of Washington sort of anybody that really the you know, CFPB like anybody that touches on like the mortgage process and I was invited um, uh, in you May, testified back in, right testified for three hours and it was my only first time on C-SPAN but it was three hours right. And, uh, so anybody could go to YouTube or C-SPAN yes. and find your testimony. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was highly critical uh, of the foundation, which there were five experts and two of them were from the foundation. And um, they, uh, one of them attacked me, you know, it sort of named names because of the massive conflict this person has in her right. job with what her husband does for a living. Which is what? Um, runs like the biggest um, online sort of, Continue ed credit thing, and they have an ex- so this is incestuous, corrupt, right? right. But just, they don't see it that way, right? Um, just because be- you're giving the gig to your husband's business doesn't mean it's corrupt. Perhaps they're the best person for this. Absolutely. Then you shouldn't be the chairman of the committee right. that changes the regulations, <laughs> that causes changes that go into the class. Anyway, it's it's a it's convoluted, but like that's what we're dealing with, right? And um. And, it's a little fiefdom. Yeah. And I, I remember after it, you know, like, I'm only in this to try to make it right <laughs> and uh, to make it fair. Uh, I don't get anything out of it other than, like, not tainting our industry. Um, How dare you, I, sir? I know. But <laughs> but anyway, it's sort of, that's the kind of stuff I talk uh, about. And, you know, you we talked earlier about the National Association of Realtors, and, and I used to be so in just infuriated by their monthly releases back in 06, 07, 08, because the first paragraph would be the data. Right. And then the next six paragraphs were just endless spin. Yeah. And it's like, I understand you're a trade group. Right. But if you're a trade group, maybe the government shouldn't rely on your data because you're not fair actors in the space. You're biased and self-interested. I, I don't care what the data is. I just need it to be accurate so I could do my job. So, that's exactly right. And and actually, um, you know, if you look at the timeline, so NAR was like the what the Fed used, the the <laughs> like right. all the NAR data for like understanding the housing market. And, um, you know, and you had the, I can't remember the, David LeRae was an right, economist. Sure. And then now it's been Lawrence Yoon ever since. Right. And I remember like in the beginning, it was like, you know, the, when Lehman happened, the Lehman right. collapse, it was like, it's a bubble with a slow leak, um, <laughs> you know, the housing bubble. And uh, there were all kinds of uh, uh, housing bubble blogs, you know, right. just huge, you know, like, you know, it's a black hole and we're all going to die. We're going to fall <laughs> on the edge of the abyss. So you get like the extremes. And then it was interesting. The Fed pivoted to Case Schiller. Right. Uh, in You know, so academia for uh, looking at um, the state of the housing market. But the problem with Case Schiller is it's the equivalent. And I've joked with you before about this, uh, you know, highly respected Nobel laureate. Um, but it's not really suitable for everyday use because it reflects the housing market five to seven months ago. So, so like when you got up this morning, did you take the average temperature of five to seven months ago <laughs> to decide what you're going to wear today? Right. right. It's, it was made for trading um, to hedge housing and it never, you know, there was no adoption um, of it. And then they, they t- went from there and then they went to core logic because it was more sort of, a little more real time, a little more, time. more, more harder data, um, more data, um, probably better. So, so you brought up David um, Larey, uh, Laria, um, 
I have a couple of of blog posts on him. Yes, but my favorite was the one that took the book he wrote and then just revised it the cover. each year. Just revised the cover. Yeah, and it's literally. Are you missing the real estate boom? Uh, was two thousand and five, and then the two thousand and six edition, same book, different cover. Why the real estate boom will not bust, and how you can profit from it now. And then the 2007 version of the exact same book, all real estate is local. Yeah, <laughs> and um, that's called repurposing, right? And and then he left in 2009. Yeah, um, and I had to change my title from one expletive to a a, a, a more tolerable expletive, which I simply just called it. Former NAR economist David Larea is a, <laughs> but it's just about. Um, it was just about an article. I don't remember if it was the Times or the Journal that working for realtors, David Larea was famously optimistic. Not so much anymore. Was right. was the headline? Right. They, so so wait, you switch jobs and suddenly your entire belief system changes. Change that. That's a little. And what, we all do it, but not a hundred and eighty degrees. No, no. Uh, it, it was uh, one of my favorite moments during the run-up to the housing bubble was I was in the green room on a national TV uh, special, something, it was like a, it was about housing and it was a town hall. And I was literally in the green room with David LeRae, <laughs> Robert Schiller, right. Susie Orman, and- uh, Dottie Herman. No. Okay. As some other, uh, I, I don't remember what he, he wasn't a housing person. And uh, I got to listen to them. I was listening to them talk, and I remember, I remember, um, this is really surreal <laughs> because wait, Larea and Schiller, that's Schiller, hilarious. yeah, yeah, because he was pretty bearish. Um, yeah, he actually, you know, was really calling for. Um, I did a thing with him, um, like a two years later um, at Lincoln Center, and uh, he was like predicting like a fifty percent correction. In housing, in housing prices, prices, which is a little aggressive, a little aggressive, <laughs> but but you know not like a single digit decline. It was you know more in the the scope of what I, happened. I did a panel with him, so it was Schiller, myself, maybe it was Dottie Herman, and somebody else. So it was like real estate, real estate, stock market, right, um, and, and then Schiller being the academic. And I referenced the um, – who are the guys who wrote This Time is Different? I'm drawing a blank. Reinhardt oh, and Rogoff. Yes. So Reinhardt and Rogoff had this wonderful paper. I want to say it was like 2006. Yeah. And they looked at five financial crises. It was Sweden, Mexico, Japan, the U.S. in 29. I never remember what the fifth one was. And they found, on average, when you have a crisis that originates in the finance sector due to too much leverage, too much speculation, on average, markets get cut in half, and real estate loses about 30% of its value. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, but when you look yeah, across the universe- Yeah, it straddles 30%. Right? And so, that, by the way, that paper, which was, I don't know, 15 pages long, became the basis for- this time it's different, 800 years of financial folly. Um, and the numbers stayed the same. It's when you have a speculative bubble built on easy money and excess lending, assume at the peak it's going to be a 30% drop in um, in real estate prices, which goes to your statement, what we're seeing today is probably not going to have the same sort of drop as then because this isn't based on easy money. This is based on where we've locked in easy money and we don't want to sell. Right. But also, uh, I, I would I would differ a little bit and say that we're not locked in on easy money. Uh, banks during the call it the pandemic or a housing boom never lost their mind. Right, and, this time and, as opposed to last time. Right, so so, and there is no, there isn't the same amount of non-bank lenders that as we saw in 06, 05, 07, right, right. That where it was outside of Fannie Mae and outside right, of outside the outside their purview. Uh -huh. um, but 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 in this cycle, like credit, you know, uh, got easier during the the boom, but it was still well below long-term norms. Um, and so, you know, even with this, you know, the inventory sort of distortion, we're not looking at the banking world like collapsing at the end of this. 
because the on the lending itself, because the lending standards never really got crazy. If anything, they got tighter. They get and yeah, especially after <laughs> the last year after rates, uh, they really clamped down. Right. Um, so li- lending is much tighter now than it was a year ago. But a year ago. It was, you know, significantly tighter than um, the last three decades, excluding the housing bubble. Um, you know, go, going back in time, it was banks just never lost their mind, which I think is a huge difference in the two eras. So, before we get to our favorite questions, let me throw you a couple of curveball questions. Uh, the first, uh, I should really just throw this one away. Um, the the article that described you as the most quotable, trusted man in New York real estate also said you look like a middle-aged Tom Hanks. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I, I don't see that. Do well, you? it's funny because, no, I, I don't see that. But um, but uh, uh, in the early days of my blogging, I think I started in 05, uh-huh. and you were you know several years ahead of me. You were my first interview on my podcast. I by recall the way. that in your old office in my, before yeah. it was renovated. Yep. Um, in, in a, I've never walked into an office where every square inch of the walls is covered with newspaper clippings and frames. <laughs> how, how many times have you been in the front page of the Times? Uh, Nineteen. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. I uh, about once a year is my, <laughs> for the last years. few days. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, but uh, yeah, I. Um, um, what, uh, what were uh, uh, Tom lost, Hanks? Oh yeah, Tom <laughs> Hanks. So a long time ago, a, a blogger in the Midwest said that um, I was a lookalike of Bobby Flay. The, I, the I've had TV. Bobby Flay on the show. I could see a, some. Sim- they did much like two, more than Tom Hanks. They 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 compared two pictures side by side, and right. it did look pretty similar. Right. Um, but that was like twenty years ago. Right. So, oh, that's, so that's and I, I I haven't been able to generate any. PR out of no, that. No more celebrity. And then the other curveball, which I'm fascinated by, I, I think you've been into pretty much every penthouse in Manhattan. I mean, maybe a that's a slight exaggeration, but not much. A lot, yeah. What's the favorite apartment you've been into in, in your history of appraising these apartments? What What's the one that really stands out? And they could be two different. Yeah, penthouses. yeah, yeah. So, so I thought... You know, forgetting the um, like the condition it was in and just like the look uh-huh. um, was uh, one of my favorites was in the Sherry Netherland, which is a hotel co-op on the corner of the southeast corner of the park. Uh-huh. Um, it was just spectacular. The view, you know, the thing that I don't get to do very much in my business is see these apartments at night. Right. And the night, you know, with all the lights, although, you know, we used to live in when we lived in Manhattan, we could see the park. Um, but I have to say, and I I'm I have a picture of myself standing on the there's a I think it's 50 Central Park South. It's not the penthouse. It was a penthouse that was going to be created inside the giant green roof uh-huh. that was you know, looks like copper, even though it was fake. It was painted green to look like it was <laughs> copper. But I literally climbed through like a porthole and stood on the roof. I have a picture of it. Um, of me. So you're outdoors. I'm outdoors, and you're in the center of Central Park South looking north, and you, you see Fifth and Central Park West on either side, and it's just spectacular, and many people don't get that opportunity. And that was uh, an amazing experience. I'm. I'm. It may end up being. A, a, hopefully, it'll. I'll be able to use it in in my uh, book someday as a cover. All right. So let's jump to our favorite questions. Starting with, what are you streaming these days? What's keeping you entertained? So uh, uh, every year, every time you ask me this, because I know you, you, you're a big fan of. Um, you know, you called this the golden age of television. It, it, is it not? I don't disagree. I mean, it, it's just I was never never watched television as a kid, and I'm making up for lost time. It is the strangest thing, but I hardly watch any TV. I know that, um, and I don't stream anything regularly. Podcasts. Um, I listen to Masters in Business. Right. Um, I sucking up not necessary, <laughs> but but it's true. Um, I uh, I listen to one of the one of my favorite new podcasts is called Hard Fork. Hard Fork. It's a New York Times podcast about technology. Huh. And it's 
the guys laugh throughout the whole show. It's they're serious writers. It's it's highly entertaining, especially following the Elon Musk and Twitter escapades over the last six months. It's been incredible, but really good stuff. Um, I listen to uh, I I really like uh, uh, Professor Galloway. Yeah, his stuff. Uh, he does a podcast called Pivot. He with... he also is locked out of his Twitter account, as am yes. I. And it's yeah. just a now I have a couple hundred thousand. He's got half a million followers. Yeah, they're like, yeah, we well, don't care. Yeah, just they just d- like it's the insane. incompetency is mind blowing. It's, it's next bu- level. Right. It's it's it it's like how to devalue an asset without even trying (laughs) and normally no one's around to pick up the pieces and take advantage it looks like threads might have a shot yeah considering that that was built with you know a a dozen or so engineers right very quickly and leveraging off of the technology of the platform for instagram but if facebook which is a giant company which is an 800 billion dollar company if they threw a hundred people at it they could, uh, to me, wait, you wouldn't hire 100 people to steal a $40 billion business? Yeah. 44, I mean, it, it, it's there for the taking. Right. Just, uh, I'm not I'm not a big Instagram fan, and no. I'm certainly not a Facebook fan, but I'm I'm on threads waiting for compliance to give me approval to start yeah. threading, yeah. tweeting? I, I don't even know what you yeah, call I, it. I call it, yeah, uh, I call it threading. But uh, yeah, I, I'm on it every day, just playing around and, and seeing, not quite Twitter yet. No, there's not enough engagement yet. But um, that, but at, the at, engagement in t- on Twitter has collapsed. Yeah, no, it's completely collapsed. Like there's it's hardly gone. any engagement. Um, now I thought that's because I have 200 followers in my backup account. Right, right. As opposed to 200,000. Right. But uh, my buddy Dave Nodick has said they he has he he has a friend who tracks thin twit activity. Yeah. And he said if you look at the top 500 or thousand accounts, everything's just fallen off a cliff. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, uh, it's 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 sad. That was my social media of choice. For, yeah, same, uh, same. for years. Um, and, and the uh, the DM side of it was really interesting. To like, I could slip into a DM with Dick Thaler and say, "Hey, have you seen this paper?" And I'm not going to bother him on his phone with that. Right. And an email seems too formal, so I I miss that. And I've kicked it up the chain at Bloomberg to try and you know figure, yeah. hey, they're a big client, and. There's like 11 people left there, and yeah. it's the same phone number that I set the account up with years ago. All right, I'm going to stop whining about my, <laughs> my and Scott Galloway's Twitter accounts and ask you, um, tell us about your mentors who helped to shape your career. Yeah, the the first one was um, before I got into real estate, actually was the food service director of a of a hospital in Chicago. I kind of knew that, didn't I? Yeah, I I ended up uh, and my first boss out of college, a gentleman named John Nelson, really just taught me how to navigate the politics and uh, how to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a uh, fascinated with post-it notes. Um <laughs> But uh, I always felt a really good, you know, I always had a really good feeling. I'd have to say um, uh, in sort of the modern era, my uh, it's it's was was Dottie Herman, um, who was basically the person that put Douglas Elman together. Um, she's not in, not active with the company these days, but uh, she saw what I did with market studies, you know, w- what I could do. And she embraced it and pushed, you know, you know, encouraged me, pushed me uh, to expand my footprint out of side of New York City. She, she's wildly, she was wildly successful in real estate. Yeah. I've met her a couple of times. She kind of reminded me of my mom. Okay. Who was one of these, like, just, uh, my mom. Outgoing mom's, broker. Cl- right. Classic real estate agent. Yep. But knew the area, knew the neighborhood, no BS. Hey, we'll find you a house that'll fit you. Yeah. And we'll do whatever we have. We'll, we'll show you a million houses if that's what it takes. She sort of like tough, broad, grew up in the Bronx, my mom. Dottie Herman kind of reminded yeah. me of that in the same way. Yeah, I always felt like, you know, she recognized 
you know, what I could do. And she pushed and protected and nurtured and made it happen. So I'm forever appreciative of and, that. And, and you've been doing these reports for Douglas Elliman for a long time. 1994 I mean, it just, is when that, I began. So you're coming up on your 30th year. That's amazing. It's a, it's, it's a lot. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know. It's, 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 it's fascinating because on one hand, you're looking at all these different markets, markets, but they, they draw, you know, you can look at very similar metrics and tell different stories by the sort of combination of the metrics. And guess what? There's median price trends in Orange County, California, just like there are in Manhattan. Right. Right. What, what do they say? And actually, I think what has really established the report series for Douglas Solomon is that it's anybody can spit out numbers. It's It's sort of you know, capturing um, the, you know, what's actually happening. Your like, reports are about putting them into context. The right context. So it's usable. Right. So so I interact with a lot of media. Um, I probably get six interactions by email or phone call every day. I don't wow. have, I don't have any PR. <laughs> and, um, um, and it's just because I, I'm accessible. Um, that's the biggest thing about <laughs> Uh, that's, media. That that's really interesting. Um, let's talk about everybody's favorite question, which is, "What are you reading?" Tell us about your favorite books and what you're reading right now. So I uh, just finished two books. One was uh, "Billionaires Row," which was written by a friend of mine, a reporter named Kathy Clark. Uh-huh. And it, if you ever want to know, like what the how insane the development <laughs> world. Um, is uh, this is the book? Because, this is about these pencil thin, right? Super tall, hundred and twenty story buildings, taller than the Empire State Building, right? But but on like a, a smaller footprint pad, that right. wouldn't have been possible fifteen years it, ago. It's all tech. It's all the material. The materials of- and the engineering has changed dramatically, but it, they're more expensive to build, right? right. And uh, yeah, and and to see you know uh, you know you have a condo that's fifteen hundred fifty feet tall tallest condo in the world 100 million dollars some crazy number well the penthouse is for sale for 250 million dollars right. good um, aspirational pricing a term that you coined yes actually right. on the air during a bloomberg interview on <laughs> a tv interview uh i don't remember like 2015 or 16 um but uh you know that you have 111 West 57th on billion billionaires row is really sort of west in East 57th Street uh-huh. uh, to Park Avenue on the east and probably Eighth Avenue on the west. Um, but then in the book she includes uh, 220 Central Park South, which has the 239 million dollar um, sale by the a, a bargain Ken compared Gervin. to 250. Right, right, exactly. You could save yourself eleven million dollars. Right, right. You've, you've is got, it is but, it true these buildings are essentially half sold? Uh, I think the numbers now is that they're about in aggregate about sixty percent sold. Woo-hoo! But there are buildings that are have done you know have sold out like four thirty two Park, uh-huh. um, and then buildings that are you know having trouble. I mean, this is. Um, you know the 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 miscalculation of billionaires row was that the market the global market wasn't as wide and as deep as everybody thought um you know i used to joke that uh these buildings or the high end buildings in new york were like the world's most expensive bank safety deposit boxes right. where you put your valuables in and then you don't go there very often <laughs> and um and that's mainly what these are where the there was a new york magazine article years ago one of these buildings where it's dark at night. There's like one or two lights on because right. nobody's there, right? It's just, they're just uh, self-storage. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, a- anyway, so, uh, but I can't say enough about this book. The other book I am re- I just read- Wait, before you go off okay. of Billionaire's Row, I-, I have to ask. So so I've seen people try and extrapolate these sales and listings, quarter billion dollars, as if it's a- an actual marketplace. It- it's almost like- Oh, there's one of eleven Rembrandts around right. for sale, and it comes up for sale every generation, and the other ten have already been grabbed by right. museums. How much can you really read into it, considering uh, there's a few dozen of these and maybe a few dozen potential purchasers? This isn't like a true real estate market. It it is a so I think of it as a market of outliers. 
Uh-huh. And and, uh, and so I told you earlier that I, I track, I started in 2014 tracking any sales that closed, that actually closed um, for uh, 50 million or higher. And then, and, um, and I went back in time back to like 2000 and really the, that world began in about 2014 uh-huh. um, uh, where there were maybe 17 or 18 nas- nationally sales, 50 million or higher. And now? And now, so uh, 2021 was the record and I, th- I bl- it was in the low 40s. I want to say there were 43 sales. Mm-hmm. They were, you know, somewhere in the mid 30s in 22. And then this year looks like it's on track to be, you know, probably in the mid 20s. Um, uh, and, you know, you look at this and there's like a transaction like a week or, you know, every other week. Um, um, but in 2021, there was like a transaction every it felt like every day it wasn't. Right. Um, it, it became a market that is detached from the local market that it sits within. In many, in, in many ways, these transactions have nothing, you know, they get so many more eyeballs through article coverage on high-end transactions right. and titans of industry buying these places, but they really are this market, um, a national or international market that's not like, hey, these are New York City sales. No, these are... You know, these are not that well connected to New York. Uh, uh, in the spring of 2022, I was speaking at uh, the International Luxury Real Estate Alliance's annual conference. And at night, we're having dinner, and one of the people uh, there uh, is a real estate agent in Palm Beach, and she gets the confirm from her assistant, hey, the $100 million house is now in contract. The deal went through. And I said, wow, that has to be a hell of a house. And I'll never forget her response was, eh, don't really like it. It has a it has a seawall. It doesn't have a beach. Not the ideal part of Palm Beach. Not, I'm like, oh, ho, ho, roll that back. <laughs> if I'm spending 100 large, yeah. you're telling me it's not the perfect house? Even $100 million is a bunch of, of compromises? And her a- answer was, it's not a lot of inv- inventory around. If you want that type of house in that part of the world, you're going to have to make some compromises. And my right. answer would be, uh, then I guess I'm going to skip that part of the world. Right, right. For exactly. $100 million, I want exactly what I want. And uh, I don't want the seawall. I want the white sandy beach. Right, right. Uh, no, it, it's it, – and it's it, – what's interesting in New York is it's – building by building so mm-hmm. so you have um 157 which was i call Extel development um uh which i think they were originally i read this in the billionaire's row book they they were originally called intel development but they got sued for the name <laughs> so they changed their name to Extel. right just and there you, you know go. because uh but but uh sales you know that closed from the sponsor the developer in 2016 um, by 2017, 2018, their values were 50% less. Really? They were selling wow. for 50% less. That seems to be about the marker. So you say, oh, that applies to all billionaires row. No. Um, you the know, you penthouse have penthouse is a lot more than everything else. Right. Well, also, too, yeah, the penthouse there sold for $100 million. Uh, Michael Dell bought it. That uh-huh. was the, at the time, that was the highest for a short period of time. But um, my point is that you look at other buildings during the same era, like 432 Park, or you look at uh, 220 Central Park South, they didn't see they didn't see 50% discounts. In fact, 220 Central Park South, a Vornado Realty development, um, the resales, the you know, uh, after they were bought from the sponsor, we've had f- um, a resale sell for double what they bought from the sponsor. Wow, uh, it, which is sort of inc- crazy, and, and it's only two blocks away. Um, but so it, that the building itself matters, not not just the building, the size, the amenities, everything about it really makes a big difference. Absolutely. All right. So besides Billionaires Row, what else? What else? Um, I just read a sort of fast and easy book just out of the blue called Easy Money, and it's basically a throttling of uh, cryptocurrency. Uh huh. Who wrote it? Um, I can't rem- I I don't remember his name, but he. Uh, it's very very clear and uh, how he's going through it, and basically there's no you know that he contends there's no value to crypto. 
you know, it's just basically, you know, it's a rife with people, n- nefarious sort of uh, types that most people lose money. I, you know, who knows? Um, but, kind of interesting, though. But it was an interesting take. And then the one I just, uh, I'm, I'm actually just started two books. Sometimes I read books in parallel, is um, a book called The Slip, which is um, about Coente's, I think that's how you pronounce it, Slip in downtown Manhattan, uh-huh. was one of the first sort of artist enclaves, uh-huh. like you would think of Soho or Tribeca right. in the 70s. Um, this was more like in the 40s and 50s. Um, and I had no idea. You know, I've never heard of this. But it's a really, it looks really good. I've read a little bit of it. And the other... The other book is that Gretchen Morgenstern. Uh, the these Plunderers. Are, the, these are the Plunderers yes. or something about. Um, I had her on the show. I read the book. She, yeah, she's really yeah. interesting. But by the way, we went to the Hopper exhibit down at the New Whitney at the end of the uh, High Line. And apparently off of Washington Square Park was another one of those artists enclave where Hopper and a bunch of his you know, colleagues. You mean like East Village, like yeah, St. Yeah. Mark's Place. Yeah, no, yeah. this is this is right off of, right off of, of West Fourth, off, okay. off of Washington Square Park. Okay, and um, there at the show, there's a series of letters printed about him arguing with his landlord and him arguing with really he he testified at the local zoning board because they wanted the it was sort of zoned the way uh, eventually Soho was right. that gave a, a good advantage to to artists. And before anyone really understood who he was, right. he was complaining and saying, you're going to change the whole character of the neighborhood from an artist's enclave to just a commercial district. And well, when I, when I first moved to New York, the East Village or, you know, Alphabet City, you know, the Avenue A, B, C, as you go further east, um, I remember there was a condo conversion uh, right on uh, the, the park there that the neighborhood centers around. And it was... It was spray painted on the front door of this conversion, uh, die yuppie scum. <laughs> I remember that, that. That became the battle cry. And uh, that you know, picture was in New York Magazine or somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that became a famous image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. It was, it was, you know, it was a pretty rough neighborhood in terms of, you know, a lot of, you know, elevated crime and all that. But now you'd never know it. Totally gentrified. Yeah, totally gentrified. Yeah, amazing. Uh, Down to our last two questions. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad interested in a career in either real estate or data analytics or appraisal? Yeah, so I'm sort of, um, I I think of it as, uh, I've seen my my various I have four four sons you know going through interview processes and first of all it's so different than when I began so I don't know how relevant my advice would be but we had you know it's all through Zoom they winnow it down you know and then you finally meet in person and you go through like multiple layers of interviews on Zoom so it's very detached there's not a lot of sort of personal connecting so so the first sort of base level advice is. Um, really think about your appearance on Zoom. It sounds really, huh, that's um, I, you know, because I find Zoom to be sort of soul sucking, you know, <laughs> after you do quite a, you know, I, during the pandemic, I think I was doing like eight hours of Zoom a day. Oh, that is soul sucking. Yeah. And, and you're just completely drained. Um, but, I, but I think that you, that's, you know, the secret to Zoom, right? Mm-hmm. To turn your camera off and just surf through, uh, bring a trailer. <laughs> and and just you know uh huh just say frequently yup yup right right yeah right. it's a bad connection I got no video and and well what I have that on got my, me what, through the pandemic when I do Zoom um you know because I always found it challenging to look up at like the top of the monitor I hate that so they I have the cameras that hang down. yeah I got uh, the camera that hangs down in the center of the screen it's very small so it doesn't right. block anything that was like one uh, during the pandemic I bought them for one for home and one for the office. Uh, through a Kickstarter startup, now there's a bunch more of them. Right. But it's the greatest thing ever for right. for that because you can check emails and look at you know if you're and not nobody knows and nobody can tell. It's 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 a it's a great invention. <laughs> that, that's hilarious. And our final question: what What do you know about the world of real estate today? You wish you knew forty years or so ago when you were first getting started. Uh, you know, I I think uh, to do everything I could to uh, buy something earlier on. I didn't buy a house till my mid-30s. 
because I was trying to grow my business. And um, I think if I had started, you know, the the idea of you know starting a little bit earlier um, is, uh, you know, when I think of the prices, even relative to my income at the time, right. it, there wasn't such a stretch, such a multiplier effect, even though mortgage rates are much higher. So let me flip that answer on you and say, would you give your kids who are now in their late 20s, early 30s, right, yeah. more or less, would you give them the same advice? Hey, buy a house sooner rather than later? Yeah. Uh, three of my four sons are um, all homeowners or multiple homeowners and, uh, you know, have set up, you know, they're, they're doing, they, they, it's worked out great. Huh. Um, so, so. Not that, you know, I advise them in the negotiation a little bit and all that, but they really did it on their own and uh, and got the homes that they love. My my youngest, um, who just uh, turned 25, uh, is living his best life in Manhattan as a renter. Right. Um, um, but, you know, he's got a completely different lifestyle than his brothers in the suburbs. So. Right. They're all married and, and getting married. Married and, you know, four grandkids. And uh, wow. you know, it's, uh, it's very odd. Jo- Jonathan, thank you for being so generous with your time. Cheryl, thank you for coming in. I-, I appreciate this. We have been speaking with Jonathan Miller. He is CEO of Moore Samuel, uh, one of the most respected appraisal and data analytics firm covering the world of residential real estate. If you enjoy this conversation, well, be sure and check out any of our previous 500 episodes we've had over the past nine years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz. Follow me on threads at Ritholtz, which used to be my uh, name on Twitter. Maybe one day I'll get that back. Follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts on Twitter at podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. Uh, Atika Valbron is my project manager. Paris Wald is my producer. Justin Milner is my audio engineer. Sean Russo is my head of research. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. <laughs>